station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is station. We are ready for the event. Consumer Electronics Show, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Jackie at CES. How do you hear me? Jackie, we uh, hear you loud and clear. And on behalf of Expedition 68, uh, the NASA team and our international partners, we welcome you to the International Space Station. All right. <laughs> We're getting some applause here. Nicole and Frank, thank you so, so much for taking the time out to join us. Greetings from all of us in Las Vegas. I know we're working with this delay, so I will jump right into the questions. You both have been in space about three months now, and you're both first-time astronauts. How are you feeling, and what has the experience been like so far? I think uh, we're feeling pretty great. This is an amazing experience, getting to float around in space. And, uh, you know, every day is different. That's what... Uh, makes working up here so special. Sometimes you'll be working on maintenance on the space station. Sometimes you'll be conducting world-class science. Uh, some days you get to do a spacewalk or, like I'll be doing in two weeks, helping uh, your crewmate get out the door so that Nicole can go out and do a spacewalk. Um, but every day you get to work with a world-class team. Uh, we have amazing support personnel on the ground, uh, both at NASA and internationally. And that makes it uh, pretty special to work up here. All right, and then I wanted to check in with you guys. We've been talking about various research projects that are sent to station by different organizations, private companies, academic institutions. Can you tell us a little bit about what research projects you've both been working on in recent days? Uh, there is a ton. I'm not even sure where to start. We've been uh, very busy conducting a lot of experiments on board. Uh, most recently, we've been working with uh, two experiments that are looking at um, growing uh, tomatoes, uh, Veggie 5. We're growing dwarf tomatoes in space, and this is to better find a way that we can sustain human diet on a long-duration mission to Mars, perhaps, and looking at different light sources and different fertilizers to help those tomatoes grow. We also have another experiment called Plant Hab, and this is looking at if the adaptive uh, behavior of the plants can be passed on to the next generation of plants. So the current plants that we're growing in space, those seeds will return to Earth, and then they'll be uh, repackaged and flown again. On the next mission, we'll be able to compare those second generation plants to seeds that came from Earth and to see if we're able to uh, transition some of those adaptive qualities to plants. Uh, we're also science um, subjects while we're in space. And uh, recently I did Cardio Breath, which is from the Canadian Space Agency. And it's looking at how your cardiovascular system changes due to microgravity. Uh, so you wear a suite of sensors while you exercise that look at heart rate, respiratory rate, and your pulse. And we can compare that data pre-flight, during flight, and then post-flight. All right, and I know that you guys have your hands in hundreds of experiments, uh, but we are at the Consumer Electronics Show here. What opportunities do you guys see for tech companies to get involved in research or demonstration projects in space? And do any that have passed through the station before stick out to you as exciting examples? Yeah, Jackie, as we transition to exploring uh, deeper and deeper into space, one of the things that we hope to do is transition low Earth orbit uh, to commercial entities. And so absolutely, uh, for instance, uh, one of the, uh, I think, coolest things we have is uh, right next to me here. It's called Astrobee. And these are autonomous uh, little self-propelled uh, robots that we are currently working with and will hopefully be able to help us in the future. Uh, they can do things like take pictures for us or uh, do stowage tracking. And uh, the more that we can offload to them, uh, the more we're available to do um, research and other types of uh, science. 
Uh, one of the things that you're familiar with, of course, is the biofabrication uh, facility. Uh, this is a really exciting thing for me as a doctor, especially. Uh, we're looking at how we can uh, replicate human tissues up here in space. And in the microgravity environment, we're finding that uh, the cellular replication tends to be uh, different and better in a lot of ways. And in the future, uh, there's hope that we can maybe fabricate entire human organs up here. And what a world-changing uh, event that would be. panelists here was in for future space stations. We know private companies are working um, to bring extra modules to the ISS as well as potentially developing their own platforms for low Earth orbit. On these future stations, what amenities would you like to see? You know, what changes could these platforms have that might help aid research or make your lives more comfortable? You're right. This is a very exciting time, especially for the commercial industry. We're just seeing an explosion of activity in low Earth orbit, and hopefully soon we'll see more people in low Earth orbit as well as these platforms mature and other opportunities uh, to travel to space and to have your science or experiment be in space. You know, as far as a laboratory goes, I think we're really finding that the future is going to be a combination of automation, computer systems, potentially robots, like Frank spoke about, and then humans on board as well. There are some things that where humans just need to interact with the experiment, but it's really how we integrate those efficiently um, along with support from the ground so that the principal investigator can be involved in the experiment to make sure everything is conducted appropriately. So I think that will be really key to efficient and successful science in the future of low Earth orbit. As far as humans uh, living and working in space, it's it's pretty awesome here on the International Space Station. Sure. You know, we've been, yeah, a shower would be nice, um, but we have plenty of hot water, so that's good. Um, but I think we've learned a lot over, you know, this is the third decade that we're gonna have humans on the International Space Station. So I think taking that information and learning from what we've done over over the years as far as adapting to accommodate humans on space station and then applying that to these other uh, orbiting laboratories or modules that fly uh, will definitely be a key to success in the future. And a question here for Frank. We have Redwire on our panel here, which was a contractor on the IROSA solar arrays that you recently conducted your first space blocks to help install. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal experience conducting a space block? It sounds like an incredible experience. And also tell us a little bit about what these new solar arrays are bringing to station. Sure, I'll tell you, uh, Spacewalk is, is uh, really pretty special. It's right up there between uh, launch and a spacewalk as far as what my favorite thing has been uh, out of this entire experience. Um, the views are, of course, fantastic. Uh, but you know, there's something also that's really rewarding about going out there and doing something really hard. And, um, and then working with an incredible team to make that hard thing seem uh, pretty straightforward and simple in some ways. Uh, that iRosa is just an incredible design. Uh, we essentially got it out there, got it set up, and then just uh, turned one last screw and it deployed itself. Um, and what it brings is a lot of um, efficiency, right? We're, for a, a much smaller size, we gain a lot more power for the station. And so we hope to use similar, if not the same technology, uh, to power our outposts on the moon. And uh, so yeah, it was re really uh, pretty, pretty darn special to be a part of that. first mission, but you're both part of NASA's Artemis team of astronauts, which means that you could be selected for a future moon mission. And we saw the Artemis 1 mission launch in November, which was the first uncrewed mission uh, around the moon. Did you guys follow along with that launch? And what are your thoughts about the future and eventually, you know, traveling deeper into space? 
We absolutely followed along on the Artemis mission. We were so excited. Unfortunately, we were not able to see the launch from the cupola, but the ground kept us informed of the exciting progress throughout the mission. They uplinked photos of the moon and photos of the moon and Earth, which was just an incredible sight. I think everybody uh, around the world was really excited for Artemis. We've, we've had a huge international team that is working towards this next step in human exploration for a very long time. And so it was great to see the results of all that effort and a successful Artemis mission. And really, it's just opening the door, opening the door to this exploration beyond low Earth orbit. And when we go to the moon this time, this will be sustained human performance or human presence on the moon. Uh, Frank spoke about the habitat that will be on the lunar surface. We're also looking at a gateway, a habitat that will be in cislunar space. Um, and again, this will be a launching point from where we can then travel to the moon to set up a long-term habitat and potentially a launching point for future deep space exploration to Mars. So I think it's a, a very exciting time for NASA, a very exciting time for the world. Uh, Frank and I are excited just to be a part of that mission and support in any way that we can, um, but I think we're going to see a lot of changes and a lot of um, advancements in technology in the next decade. All right, and then if you guys can walk us through, obviously an Artemis mission is very different than a stay on the International Space Station, but can you walk us through a little bit how your experience on the station now and some of the research you're doing might benefit some of those deep space missions and you know this pathway uh, to the moon and eventually Mars? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, the uh, the International Space Station provides a really unique platform. Obviously, it's the only uh, permanent microgravity platform that we have uh, where we can study kind of the, the hardest part of space exploration, which is human presence. Uh, unfortunately, we are uh, pretty complicated to keep alive in, in outer space. And so this allows us to, um, you know, study that in depth for a long period of time. We've been living here for over 20 years. And as we transition further and further away, uh, we're gonna need to be a lot more autonomous. Um, the benefit of being on station is that we can relatively quickly get home. But as we transition to the moon and even further, uh, we're gonna need all those 20 years of experience uh, to make sure that we set ourselves up for as much success as possible um, for you know, being three days or five days or three months away from the Earth. Uh, so it's pretty exciting times. Uh, you know, I think at heart, all of us as uh, astronauts are explorers and scientists. And so being a part of this incredible team that gets to make this happen um, is, is gonna be pretty special. All right, and uh, since you guys have been on station, you've also worked through challenges, unexpected things are always coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about how, when you're in the space environment, you work through unexpected things and, and how you get back on track, back on schedule? Uh, you nailed it, and unexpected uh, definitely happens quite often. You know, the good thing is that we prepare for that on Earth. We have a team of folks that train us to really be prepared to execute whatever procedure, um, whatever call up that the ground has us needing to execute. And so we have a, a general knowledge of operating the space station of these emergency, or in-depth knowledge of the emergency procedures, uh, but there's always a situation that will arise that perhaps we weren't able to predict on the ground. Unfortunately, we have teams on the ground that can work through uh, these issues and then send recommendations up to the space station. We all have our roles and responsibilities, and we've worked well together as a team. So I think that is a very important part of the teamwork of living in space. Um, a crew really needs to work together. You need to know when it's time to lead and when it's time to follow. Uh, when we work together to execute some of these off-nominal procedures, uh, we're definitely focused on, on mission accomplishment and getting that procedure done. 
Then at the end of that, we'll take some time to regroup, um, perhaps debrief things that we had learned, things that we can do better next time. And then you need to really be able to compartmentalize and shift your focus back to whatever the schedule is for the day and the other events that need to get done. Um, so it's, a, it's very exciting. Um, sometimes it can be uh, very stressful, uh, but we are fortunate to have great training and great support from the ground to be able to deal with any situation that will arise in space. And I know that everyone in the audience here will be curious just to hear a little bit about what your day-to-day -day lives are like on station and what you're most looking forward to uh, when you come back home. Yeah, Jackie, uh, that's one of the fun parts. Again, like I said, every, every day is different, um, but there are some similarities between uh, every day. So we do work out about two hours every day, right? So um, the fact that you're not walking and standing uh, doesn't put the necessary stress on your bones that you need for actually um, to maintain not just bone density, uh, but as you know, uh, bones produce most of our blood. And so keeping that machinery going really uh, requires that stress. And so we do resistance training on a machine called ARED, uh, which uses air pistons to provide resistance. And we spend about an hour on that. And then another 45 minutes to an hour doing cardiovascular uh, fitness stuff. And you can run on a treadmill, uh, which you use uh, bungee cords to essentially pull you down so that you're able to run in place. Uh, or you uh, strap into a uh, ergometer in, in the form of a uh, bicycle, and you can uh, bike in place for uh, 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, so that uh, happens every day while we're up here, and it, um, it's a kind of a refreshing start um, to your day or in the middle of your day. Um, every day, obviously, we have to eat and prepare our food. Uh, all of our food comes up here uh, dehydrated, and so we um, hyd hydrate it, heat it up, and eat. And one of the neat things about Space Station is that we recycle all of our fluids, right? All of our sweat, all of um, everything else is uh, filtered and then made into purified 100% pure water. And uh, we drink that and that cycle keeps going each and every day. Um, but yeah, for me, I think I just love the fact that, you know, on some days I'll be doing maintenance and uh, replacing some intricate part of the Space Station. And on other days I get to grow tomatoes or do something uh, neat like that that seems pretty uh, mundane but uh, here on, in space is actually pretty difficult, and it's a uh, need to try to prove uh, ways that we can maybe uh, provide fresh food to, uh, to ourselves or to our uh, teammates uh, when we're on the moon. All right, and I know that everyone here is just coming off of the holiday season, and we celebrate it in our earthly ways. How did you guys on station welcome in the new year and celebrate the holidays? Oh, while we are, were in space, we did get some time off, though, which was very nice. So, of course, we were able to call home and talk to our families and friends and our loved ones. Uh, but just like I'm sure you did on Earth, we spent time uh, together. So the crew came together. We had some uh, special food that the ground sent up, and we enjoyed a nice meal. Uh, we have a uh, video projector that we can project you know, just from the laptop. Uh, a Yule log on the fire. So we put that on the fire. We had some good <laughs> holiday music um, and we kind of got dressed up with, uh, you know, hats and, and funny sweaters. Uh, so we were able to relax and have a good time over a really nice meal. Uh, additionally, I think each of us probably spent our own personal time in the cupola. And the cupola, I'm sure you know, is the module on the bottom side of the space station that faces planet Earth. And it's covered in windows. And, and that's just a beautiful area where we can observe Earth and capture some uh, photographs of Earth and uh, conduct some Earth observations. But it's also a time to kind of sit and personally reflect a little bit on your mission in space, on really the, uh, the planet and everything that we're doing as a human species, and just be grateful uh, for the opportunity to be in space. And so that's a, an incredible view. I know that we, we cherish that and certainly welcomed in uh, 2023 uh, with beautiful views of our planet Earth. Thank you so, so, so much to both. I know we're running out of time here and Mission Control will surely kick
kick me off soon. So I just wanted to send an extra special thank you and a big hello from everyone here in Las Vegas. We wish you the best and a safe return home. Well, thank you guys so much. It was awesome to spend uh, a little bit of time with you guys. We can't wait to see the uh, tech that you guys have in store for us when we get back to Earth. So thank you for uh, spending this time with us. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you to all the participants from the Consumer Electronics Show. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communication.